In a world that seems shaky and unsure, in a life that feels uncertain and unclear, there is this place that gives shelter from the storm, not by the roof over our heads. There's this place that puts solid ground under our feet, but not because the floor is strong. There's this place that's fortified on all its sides, but not because the walls are sturdy. This house of prayer is not a building, but it's built on the cornerstone of Jesus. A foundation poured from the Word of God. We faithful gather together, believers from all walks of life, followers of Christ, the body, the bride, sinners to be sure, but cleansed by the blood of Jesus, celebrating the new life made possible by the sacrifice Jesus made. It's here that we celebrate the good news, then go out to share it with a world in need of hearing it. This is the church. Come on in. You're always welcome here. Well, I'm excited to start a new series about the church this Sunday, and we'll run it for about three weeks. And I want to show us some important things that we need to know about the church. First of all, that everyone needs the church today, that we need to be encouraged uh, to see the value of the church in our daily lives and reveal the mission of the church and challenge us to be on mission with Jesus. And so I'm encouraged about this. One of my hopes during this series is that we would understand that we need to do more than just go to church, but we need to be the church. See, the church is not this building, is it? It's us. It's you and me. It's the people. And it's the relationships that we are building to help us know, grow, and go for Jesus and live for him daily. And so I'm excited about that because the church is the people who love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and love their neighbors as themselves. And so I want to talk about that. Uh, if you have your Bible, you can open it to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to get to Matthew chapter 16 in a couple minutes. But as we start and begin and begin to process things, I want to talk today about the purpose of the church. See, purpose asks the question why, or tries to answer it, I guess you would say. Why does something exist, or why do we need it, or why is it important in my life? Purpose gives things value and helps us answer the why question, because all of us have that question regularly about the things that we're doing in our life. So to have value, something needs to have purpose. This is similar to when you look at a, a man's large toolbox in the garage. Now, ladies, I know you're laughing because you're probably thinking what? Does he really need that many tools? Yes, he does need that many tools because each tool has a purpose. It has value. It saves time. It makes the job easier. And in some cases, the only way to get the job done is with that one tool. Guys, we have the same question, don't we? Does she really need four spatulas? Yes, yes she does. Because one flips eggs, and one flips quesadillas, and one flips hamburgers, and one cleans the skillet, right? See, they have purpose, they have value, they answer why. And we're going to talk about that. Now, some people would ask that same question about the church. Do we really need the church? What are those people doing? Why are they valuable to the world today? Do we need them in our city? Are they important to our city? Do they bring value and purpose to our lives? Or do they just kind of us four and no more over there? Well, the answer is yes, the church is needed. The world needs the church. And my hope for us as a church, you've heard me say this before, but my hope for us as a church in Cheney is that if Cheney Faith Center went away, our city would be concerned. They'd start to wonder, where did that church go? Because we're involved in the city. We're serving. We're loving. We're gracious and kind. And we're presenting Jesus to the world. And so my hope is that as a church, 
If we went away for one reason or another, even though we're not, amen? Our city would feel that impact because we're choosing as a group of people who love Jesus to serve a lost and hurting world in whatever way we can. And that could be choosing to coach a team somewhere. It can be serving at Mayfest. It can be doing Candy Corner Carnival. It's coming up, amen? Amen. All kinds of things like that that are ways we're involved in our church. So this morning, we're gonna talk about purpose. And in particular, we're gonna try to answer this question. Why does the church exist? Why does the church exist? Well, probably the best place to start is with the words of Jesus. So we're going to do that. We're going to start with the words of Jesus. This is one of the very first times that Jesus talks about the church, and it's in Matthew chapter 16. So if you have your Bible with me, you can open it, or you can turn your Bible on, whichever you do. Uh, And we'll get to Matthew chapter 16, and I'm going to start in verse 13 and go through verse 20, and then we'll also look at some additional verses as we continue to go. It says this, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So let's jump in. The first reason that the church exists, we see in verse 18. And in verse 18, Jesus said something in particular, and that is very important. Jesus said this, the church exists because Jesus is building it because Jesus said what? I will build my church. Now that's good news, isn't it? Aren't you glad that you aren't building the church and that I'm not building the church? Jesus is building the church. Now, in particular, let me just get us back to Scripture here and get us into context. How many of us know, I talk about this a lot, that context is everything to how we look at Scripture. Now, in this section, in particular, Jesus gives us the context, but he also gives us the exact and specific reason that the church is built. And it's in verse 21. In verse 21, Jesus says this, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must, would you turn to your neighbor and say, he must, go ahead, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that, He must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. This is it. This is the moment where Jesus said, this is what the church is all about. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus is the most incredible love story that you and I will ever know or experience. And Jesus' death and resurrection are the foundation of, of the church. Therefore, there will always be a remnant of people that believe in Jesus. They'll believe in Jesus as their Savior, and they'll believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God. Why? Because even the gates of hell, even all of the power of hell cannot come against it, cannot come against this one moment that Jesus decided to leave heaven and come to earth, die on a cross, and come back to life for you and I. See, all around the world today, Jesus is building his church. In fact, hundreds and hundreds of millions of people, maybe close to a billion people, woke up this morning and decided to make today special. To make today a day that I'm going to go worship my Savior. 
my king, the anointed one, Jesus. And so all around the world, people are meeting in different places. Some of us get to meet in a great place like this where we have soft seats where even if I preached for four hours, you'd still be comfortable on that chair. (laughs) And some of our brothers and sisters are hiding out. Maybe they're in a cave talking about Jesus. Maybe they're in an underground church and they've spent three hours all morning evading authorities just to get to church to talk about the one that they love, Jesus Christ. See, all around the world today, people have made a decision because of what Jesus did on the cross. There are supernatural stories in every single generation. Your story is one of them, mine too, of someone that believed in Jesus for the first time and those who were called to preach the gospel of Jesus to a lost and hurting world. These stories exist because Jesus died on the cross and came back to life and he is continuing to touch people throughout the world all the time, touch their hearts and their lives, giving them opportunities to believe in Jesus. See, the church will always exist because the bond that holds us together is Jesus' blood and blood is thicker than water, amen? In fact, Jesus' blood is even stronger than duct tape. I'm thankful for that. So the church exists because Jesus is building it. The second thing that we see in this section of verses is in verse 18 as well and continues on um, as well. The second reason the church exists is because people believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. Now in verse 18, Jesus said this, on this rock, I will build my church. And for the readers in the New Testament, they understood that immediately because you always built a house on a rock, right? We do it on concrete today. So if we were gonna translate it, we would say what? On this concrete, we build a house. What Jesus is saying is on this rock, I will build my church. The foundation of the church is something that Jesus was revealing. In other words, there must be a foundation for this new group of people to be built upon. They need a foundation, and I will give them one. On this rock, I will build my church. So that brings up a question. What is the rock Jesus is referring to? Well, some people have said that that rock is Peter because Jesus changes Simon's name from Simon to Peter here, and Simon means reed, someone that's just bending and swaying in the the world and in the wind, and he changes his name to Peter. So it must be that Peter is the rock that we're building the church on. Does that make sense? No. It doesn't make sense that Peter is the foundation of the church. It makes sense that Jesus is the foundation of the church. So what what is the rock that Jesus is referring to? The rock is what Peter declared about Jesus. And what did Peter declare? That Jesus, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So the church... The people of God are building their lives on this truth that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the anointed one. He's the Son of the living God. So our foundation is Jesus. And our foundation is what Jesus did on the cross and through the resurrection. Now Jesus said something in particular that was extremely important and personal for every person. Every person in the world will deal with what Jesus talked about in verse 15 at one point or another in their life. Jesus asked this important question. But what about you? Who do you say I am? Every single one of us has answered that question, hopefully. Now, if you haven't answered that question, I hope you're getting closer to the answer to that question. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you think he is? What does God's word say about him? See, each one of us has made a decision to believe in Jesus and follow him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And everywhere around the world, people are choosing to deny their cultural religious ideas and believe in Jesus. Now, we did the same. We denied our American religious ideas and we believed in Jesus. Is it Pastor Mark? As Americans, don't we believe in Jesus? 
No, we don't. Now, I, I hate to burst your bubble, but the United States is not a Christian nation. It doesn't take you very long to figure that out when you walk outside these doors, do you? Now, we think we are. Like in, in our head, we think we are. If you do a poll and you ask our nation, are you a Christian? Roughly 60 to 70% will say, yes, I am. But do they know what that means? <laughs> Have they really answered the question, I know who Jesus is and I'm living for him and I'm following him? Have they chosen to deny themselves and follow Christ? That's not what our world tells us. That's not what society is telling us. Jesus said something very interesting in verse 24. Look at it with me. As Jesus continued his discourse about the church and about what it means to believe in him and what it means to be a disciple of his, someone that is following him, Jesus said this in verse 24. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? What good will it do for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Now look at this with me. Jesus said that there are several things that are included in living for him. The first one, denying ourselves. And nobody likes to do that, but it's part of being in relationship. Have you discovered that being in relationship with anyone in this world requires you to deny yourself at some point or another? That's what relationships are all about. Now, in particular, when we go into relationship with Jesus, the same is true because now we're serving the living God. So we deny ourselves. We take up our cross. What does that mean, take up my cross? Does Jesus want me to die for him? Well, if I have to, yes, he does. But what does it really mean practically day to day? It means that there are things in our life that need to die. There's certain things in my life that I really like that get in the way of me loving and serving Jesus. Anybody else have something like that in your life? You don't have to raise your hand. I'll just raise my hand for all of us. How about that? We all have things in our life, don't we, that get in the way of us living for Jesus and serving Jesus and those things, they need to die so that we can serve Jesus with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So we deny ourselves, we take up our cross, we follow Jesus. And that means I'm not following myself anymore. It also means I'm not following the world. I'm not following our culture. I'm not following what everybody else is doing. I'm not doing what the Joneses are doing. I'm doing what Jesus asked me to do. I'm following Jesus. Fourth, I, I, I give up my own life to serve Jesus. So whatever Jesus would like me to give up, I'm going to give that up to serve Jesus, right? Just to, on a small note, I gave up baseball to serve Jesus. Anybody else give up something, right? I, baseball scholarships were in my future. I had a couple and I said, okay, uh, Jesus said, if you're going to serve me, you got to give that up. And that took me a while, <laughs> It took me about a year and a half to go, I'm, I'm not so sure about this. Because I really like that. I really want to do that. And eventually, who won? Jesus did. And aren't you glad he did? Yeah. I am too. Because I really wouldn't have gone very far. <laughs> it was a pipe dream. Lastly, we're called to pursue Jesus' kingdom, not the material benefits of this world. That's kind of the last thing Jesus says. If you could gain the whole world and forfeit your soul, would you do that? Now, here's what's interesting. Our culture, our culture, the American culture, because we can, because we're very wealthy, we can what? We can pursue all the pleasures of this world. Right here. Right here in our home. Right here in the United States, we can pursue all of the pleasures of the world. Because all of the pleasure of this world, what? Comes here to sell their goods to us. So we have to make a decision. Am I going to serve the things of this world or am I going to serve Jesus? Now let me give us a small warning based on what Jesus just said and what we see happening in our world today. 
In the United States and in most progressive nations, we are challenged to deny something different than people might be denying in a developing country or in a third world country. I think we are experiencing what we see and what I see in particular. We're seeing a new form of deception that is extremely powerful. The new gods that I see taking root in our culture globally are humanism and narcissism. These two things are taking over the world. Both focus on ourselves and the view that we don't need Jesus. We don't need the Messiah, the Son of the living God in our lives. Because humanism says what? As humanity, we're smart enough. We don't need God. We've figured out everything scientifically or or enough that we don't need God anymore. And we've figured out a way and made up theories so we can excuse God out of the theory. And that's not my message this morning, but we'll, we'll preach some good messages in the future why that's not, that theory doesn't exist at all or is not scientific in any way. We also have new political structures to take care of one another instead of letting God take care of us, instead of letting us take care of each other. And so because of these things, We don't need God is what we say. This is very dangerous. But it's also very powerful. And it's powerful because in particular, it capitalizes on our own wants and needs. It capitalizes on our own selfishness. So we easily gravitate towards it because it sounds good. It feels good. It looks good. And we desire it. This is why Jesus said part of following him and being in relationship with him is denying ourselves. So denying ourselves is one of the foundations of our relationship with him. It's also one of the foundations of the church of Jesus Christ. It's one of the things that the people that call themselves the church of Jesus Christ do together. We deny this world for Jesus together so that the world can see Jesus in us. See, as long as we are focused on ourselves, we will not see that we need a Savior and the living God who left heaven so that we could be in relationship with Him. That's why humanism and narcissism are working so well right now. Our choice as the people of God is to live for Jesus instead of ourselves so that people believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So that's a great place to start because those are the words of Jesus. But as you begin to look elsewhere in the New Testament, you begin to discover other reasons that the church exists. Let me give you two more. Even though there's probably about 20, I'll give you two for the sake of time. The third reason that I believe the church has a purpose and why the church exists is to help one another financially just to be a help to one another. Now, this is a really strong theme throughout the New Testament. You will see this a lot. A lot of times, one group is in trouble or suffering or being challenged and needs some help, and it's the church, another church, or another group of people that call themselves Christians that take up an offering, give financially to their brothers and sisters of Christ or to the world in order to help out of the compassion of Jesus Christ that they have in their heart to glorify Jesus in the world. Let me give you several examples of this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the Apostle Paul is talking about this with the church in Corinth because of something in particular that is happening to the church in Jerusalem. Look at it with me. Now about the collection for the Lord's people, and let me just stop there. So Paul's talking about this collection that he's making financially for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. Now, what we know historically from church record is in the middle of the first century, the church in Jerusalem was suffering greatly. 
for two reasons mostly. One, because of persecution. The church in Jerusalem was being greatly persecuted because they were beginning to believe in Jesus Christ. And second, there was a famine. So there was a drought, there was a famine, food was not growing very well. And so the, the church, because they are choosing to serve Jesus and it makes it hard to exchange money in the marketplace and get food. And just the daily part of life is harder because people don't want to do business with you in the first century. These things were challenging. And so Paul was taking a collection from the churches in Corinth and Philippi and all over Galatia. Uh, and so he was taking this collection to the church in Jerusalem to help them in their time of need. So Paul was asking the church to take up an offering for when people needed help. Now, this still happens today. Recently, you'll remember about a month and a half ago, we stood up and asked for you to give an offering to the people in, um, in our area that had been affected by the fire in Medical Lake, right? And you responded. You gave out of the abundance of your heart and out of the abundance of your wallet, praise the Lord. And we gave. And that was really awesome because we, we gave to one another and we were helping one another. Now, let me, let me just tell you something about that that is really cool. Because one of the reasons that we exist as the church of Jesus Christ in the world is to help one another financially. And we take care of the needs of God's people and those that are also struggling in life. And so a financial discipline that needs to be a part of each of our lives in order for Jesus to get the glory that he deserves is that we give financially to the church and we give financially to other people and to all kinds of organizations so that Jesus can get the glory. Amen? Let me give you two examples of this. The first one is in the summer, we have AMP Camp. And AMP Camp is awesome. And one of the things that we talk about is that, you know, if, if, it, if it pleases the Lord and, and you have the ability, could you give a scholarship to someone to go to AMP Camp? Maybe you're not sending some kids and you want to send some kids or whatever, you have a little extra money and you want to help uh, give some kids a scholarship, that's a great thing to do. Well, this year we had something really cool happen. This year, Fellowship Baptist right here in Cheney that's on the other side of town over by Sound Lake area, they decided to give us money for camp so we could scholarship three students to go to camp. Oh, isn't that cool? That's the church helping one another and the body of Christ doing stuff together so that three kids who couldn't afford to go to camp could go to camp. That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Can we just give Fellowship Baptist a hand real quick? That's pretty awesome. I love it. Now, Philippians chapter four, verse 15 says this. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. Now, Paul expresses something that I think is really important here. He expresses a spiritual discipline that should be evident in all the people that are following Jesus. It's the ability to give and receive financially for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Because there are times that we can give and there are times that you will need to receive. Now, which is harder? Receiving. It's almost always harder, right? It's almost harder, always harder to go and ask for help and say, gosh, I, I need some help. But how many of us know that we would like as a church, because we are giving financially, to have a little nest egg set away that our council puts in a savings account so that when somebody in our church needs help, we can help them. And we do. We do that as a church. Our council has set that aside. And there are people that give to our benevolence fund, and sometimes you do that as well. And that's just set aside there so that when somebody in our church needs help, we can say, yes, we can help you. That happens often. We've helped a, a gentleman pay for an electric bill recently, helped a lady in our church fix her car. That's, those funds are there to help one another financially. Now, also recently, You'll remember we took an offering 
uh, for the families that were affected by the Gray Road Fire in Medical Lake. And I wanted to tell you how we've used some of that money because it's just really cool to, to get a, 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 just a, a testimony about what's going on. Well, one of the things that we discovered right away as school was starting was there were families coming in that were like, hey, everything burned in the fire. We've got nothing. We don't have a pen. We don't have a pencil. We don't have a backpack. We've got nothing. So we decided to go to Walmart and take $1,500 and turn that into $25 gift cards. So we got as many $25 gift cards as we could with $1,500. And then we dispersed them evenly through the three schools, the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school at Medical Lake. And so the school district knows that Cheney Faith Center gave that money. And the school secretaries know that Cheney Faith Center gave that money. So every single time that secretary goes to her drawer and pulls out a $25 gift card, who gets the glory? Jesus does. When she gives it to that family and that family asks, hey, how, where'd you get that? And she says, I got that from Cheney Faith Center. Then what happens? The family gets to know that Jesus gets the glory. And when the family goes to Walmart and they spend their gift card and then they tell the cashier at Walmart that they got this gift card from a church in Cheney, then who gets the glory? Jesus gets the glory again. That happens because we've learned the habit of giving and receiving financially for the kingdom of God. Now, the final purpose I want to share with us today about why the church exists is for the encouragement of the believers. It's for us. It's for you and me. Encouragement is very important. You need encouragement, and so do I. It's especially valuable when you're struggling or the circumstances in your life are challenging. That's when we especially need encouragement. Now, our faith context today Happens to be challenging, doesn't it? When you and I leave this room, we go out into the world and we live our week and we go to work and we go to play and everywhere we go, our faith context today is challenging. It's difficult. Our culture and our world globally and nationally is not super excited about Jesus all the time. And so it's not making it easy to live for Jesus. Therefore, Encouragement is a must. Encouragement for you and I is a must to come together and receive encouragement regularly. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Let me ask you an important question about encouragement. Do you have someone in your life that encourages you to live for Jesus? If I ask that question, I say, do you have someone in your life that encourages you to live for Jesus? Do you have someone that comes to your mind immediately? Like, this is my person. This is the person that uh, holds me accountable. This is the person that I go to coffee with. This is a person that I regularly pray with, that I study God's word with, that I can talk to about Jesus that helps me with the challenges I face in the world. Now, ho hopefully that is your spouse, but hopefully it can be extended. It's somebody else. It's a small group of people in our church. It's somebody you see every week when you come here. Whatever it is, every single one of us, each one of us needs a good friend that helps us every week, every day to continue to live for Jesus. See, I hope you have that person because throughout your day, you could experience something very challenging throughout your day that, that is in particularly coming against your faith. And you can quickly text that person and say, hey, just shoot up a prayer for me really quick. I'm going into a meeting. And um, last week, this meeting was particularly antagonistic against Jesus. And I, I just want to do a good job to honor him in this meeting. Great, you got someone to pray for, to pray with, because we need encouragement all the time. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25 says this, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together 
as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. All right, everybody raise your hand. Pat yourself on the back. That's for not giving up meeting together today. Good job, way to go. Right? But here's what's important. The writer of Hebrews says what? Because the world is the way the world is and because we are choosing to deny ourselves and live for Jesus and share the love of Jesus with the world, you and I, we need encouragement every week. In fact, we probably need encouragement more than once a week. And so the writer of Hebrews says what? Don't stop meeting together. You have to meet together. It's a must for you. So don't give it up. Don't stop meeting together. Choose to be in church every single week because you need it. It's important to go to church, but it's even more important to be the church. See, we're supposed to meet together because important things happen when we're together. When we're together, we encourage one another. We pray for one another. We eat together. We sing together. We operate in our spiritual gifts to build each other up in Jesus. And we challenge one another to love and serve the world for Jesus. When we go to church, be the church. I want to encourage you, when you go to church, don't just go to church, be the church. When you come to church, when you come to Cheney Faith Center, I guarantee you, there is someone that needs you. Right? Which brings up uh, another why question, another purpose question. Why do we go to church? Now, there's two ways. There's two reasons to go to church. I go to church for me, which is narcissistic in its nature, or I go to church for you. There's a big difference there, right? If I go to church because I want to serve, and I go to church because I want to worship, and I go to church because I believe the Holy Spirit has me to encourage someone and if we all do that together, we all come in the building and we start looking for someone we can encourage, then what will happen? We'll all be encouraged. Because if every single one of us is looking for someone to encourage, I'll encourage someone, but someone's going to encourage me. In fact, statistically, mathematically, what will happen? I'll encourage one person, but most likely I'll get encouraged two or three times. It works really well that way. So I want to encourage you, don't just come and leave. Stay a while. Take your coat off. Hang out. See how the Holy Spirit might use you. Find someone you can love on. Find a place to serve. Look for someone that maybe just looks like they need a hug or a hi or a how you doing or can I pray with you. That's what it means to be the church, to encourage one another. So let's choose that. Let's choose to encourage one another. Let's get together regularly. Let's build each other up in Jesus' name. Let's confess Jesus as our Savior and help others to believe in him too. Let's give financially so Jesus will be exalted in our world. And let's encourage each other with our words and our actions regularly. This is what it means to have purpose as the church. Would you stand with me? Now let me close with this little idea that we talked about just for a moment that Jesus mentioned in verse 15. And it's an important question. Jesus asks this question to you and me. Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? See, when it gets right down to Jesus and the church, the question is personal. It's a personal question. And Jesus asks every one of us this question. 
Who do you think Jesus is? And then second, are relationships with other believers important to you? Those are the two questions that I can see in this section that Jesus would want us to ask this morning. Who do you think Jesus is? And are relationships with other believers important to you? I'd like us to just, just for a minute, could we just be quiet in the room and think about those two questions? And so let's bow our heads. Maybe just close our eyes so we're not distracted in the room. And let's think about these two questions. Who is Jesus to you? And are relationships with other believers important to you? Let's take a minute and just respond to the words of Jesus right now. I want to ask a question that's the same one Jesus asked, but it's super important. It's for us in the room and for anyone online. Maybe you might be watching this live right now, or you might watch it a week from now or a month from now. But the question is still the same. Who do you think Jesus is? he the Savior? Is he your Savior? If he's not your Savior, if, if you don't know who Jesus is, maybe you'd like to start that this morning. It's really simple. You just confess it. Just like Peter did. You just confess, I believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So before we move on, I want to ask just this simple question. Is there anyone in the room that would like to declare that this morning? Anyone online that would like to declare that this morning? If that's true, if that's where you're at and you'd like to declare that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior of your heart and your life, that he's the Son of the living God, just would you just raise your hand? I'd, I'd like to pray with you. Would you just pray a quick prayer with me for those that have raised their hands? Would you do that with me? It's a great, great thing to do for all of us too. It just reminds us of what we're declaring. Dear Jesus, I declare that you are my personal Savior. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Set me free from them. Deposit your eternal life in my heart. I believe in you. And I ask you to forgive me. I ask for your Holy Spirit to come live inside of me and help me live for you each day. Amen. The second question. Are relationships with other believers important to you? I just want to ask you, you you might come to a church here and that's great, but maybe the relationships aren't as important as they should be. And you know you need to take it to the next level. You need, to, you need to have a friend or a friend group that you're serving Jesus with. If that's you and you need to make that next step and you'd like me to just pray for you about that, would you just raise your hand? All right, several going up around the room. Good. All right, let's pray. Jesus, thank you for these hands that have been raised that, Lord, they're declaring right now in this room, in your presence to you that they need to get into some, some better relationships with Christian people in our church so that they might grow in Christ. So, Lord, I pray that you would encourage them to come to a Bible study where they would meet some people 
and that they would get acquainted with, with somebody in our church and they would ask that question, hey, could we do coffee? And then could we start doing life together? <laughs> Lord, help us as a church be about the business of being in relationship with one another, that we would encourage one another. We'd pray for one another. We'd eat together. We'd worship together. We would be one another's best friends so that Jesus would be exalted in our lives and so we, we could live the life that Jesus calls us to in this world. We give you thanks and praise for that. And Holy Spirit, I'm just gonna ask that you would supernaturally provide the friendships that every single person that raised their hand needs and that it would be just the right person that would be a good fit for them to serve Jesus. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so I get to encourage you this morning not to just go to church, but to be at a church. Uh, hang out if you'd like. Pray with somebody if you need to. Our prayer people are going to come up. If you need prayer, please don't leave until you pray. Always remember, Jesus loves you very much. So do Kate and I. Have a great week.